Okay, there we go. All right. <laughs> Welcome to, oh yes, no section this week. I'm going to announce that. Um, I don't know, there must be some way to turn these lights on, but I guess I'll figure out another week. All right. This is Phil 100B, Rationalists by Maeve Stone. You can call me Abe or Professor Stone. I'm, I'm completely fine either way. Um, and oh, also, so since I didn't have my computer, I didn't end up printing out my notes. I actually am this flustered, but this is like an extreme example of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 all right. Okay, and so, um, uh, oh, and we have two TAs, Edwin and Takuma, are there. Um, so, um, I'm so like what I'm mostly just going to go through the syllabus today and then give a uh, like overview of the course. Uh, it, despite the late start, it might not still go the whole time because there isn't any reading to discuss yet. So we can hope. <laughs> uh, although oftentimes when I say that, it ends up taking the whole time anyway. Um, but okay, so as far as just going through this. Um, so the best way to reach me is by email. Um, my email's on the syllabus. There used to be someone, I haven't had complaints about this in a while. There used to be someone with a very similar email address who would get like, it was like a D a B stone or something I would get complaints that they were getting emails from all my students. Um, uh, so I definitely will try to check that at least a couple of times a day. Um, uh, I didn't, I used to put my office phone number on here, but the truth is that I'm not in my office that much. <laughs> um, so, uh, because I live in Berkeley. So like I come to Santa Cruz um, I'm here for a little while and then I go back to work. <laughs> um, so, uh, like I said, email is probably the best way to reach me. Um, I will have both. I think I will have one Zoom office hour and one in-person office hour, but I haven't started, figured out when those will be yet. Um, and uh, I guess the other important and also, I don't know if the TAs are planning to have off scheduled office hours or not. I guess we'll make an announcement about that soon. But if not, you should be able to reach them, you know, on a by appointment basis. Um, and uh, I guess the other important piece of contact information, all of this is printed on the syllabus, is um, my courses web page. Right. Everyone's seen this now, right? <laughs> I'm on the screen, yes. Hilda Abe Stone courses. So that there's like a list of every course I ever taught, but this course is at the top. And so there's a link to the syllabus. There's there's this PDF version that I handed out. There's also a HTML version of the syllabus. And there's already links to the three written assignments there as well. You know, look at those now if you want. Um, uh, okay, and sections will not meet the first week. That was, that was just, that was written on the board. 
Um, right, and so I guess uh, the, um, so to speak, official version of the syllabus is the one that there's a link to here, um, just in the sense that if there have to be any changes, I mean, there aren't usually, but sometimes there are, like, for example, if there's a strike, sometimes the schedule has to change, you know, so uh, if there are any changes, I'll make the changes in the online syllabus. Um, and um, the, there, so will, there will link, there are links to the assignments, both on this page and from the syllabus, uh, to the written assignments, and they will be links to the metaphysics exercises, which I'll describe <laughs> in a second. Um, okay. Um, so are there any questions about what I said so far? About like how to reach me, stuff like that? Okay. Um, okay, so um, first of all, as it says here, I'm going to lecture in person, uh, you know, uh, unless there's natural disasters or whatever. <laughs> uh, I'm going to lecture here in person. I also uh, will have a live Zoom feed, and I'm recording the lectures and I'm gonna put those up on YouTube. Um, I very much encourage you to come up to lecture uh, uh, in person if possible, and if not, to come on Zoom. Uh, uh, it's not, attendance at lecture is not a course requirement, but I hope you'll come. I, I mean, I know from experience that later in the quarter, a lot of people won't come, but I hope you will because <laughs> It's so sad when I come up and lecture and there's no one here. All right. Um, uh, I don't know how much longer I'm going to keep doing this thing with being available in all these different ways, but I'm, I'm still doing it this quarter. Um, course requirements. Let's do this again. Um, so participation in discussion sections is a, is a course requirement. However, first of all, this is not an attendance requirement. It's a participation requirement. So, um, and uh, second of all, it's, uh, it's enforced in the following way, namely that as it says here in parentheses, good participation will be possible grounds for raising a course grade, especially if it's on a borderline. This really only if it's on a borderline. Um, but a lot of grades often are in a borderline. <laughs> so, um, so you know, so the way this works is like at the end of the quarter, I'll ask the TAs who was a good participant in section and they'll send me a list. And then if those people's grades are near a border, I'll bump them up. Um, so you can get an A in the course and, and never go to section. Um, uh, uh, you could always go to section and not get the bump up if you never say anything. <laughs> you could go to section like a lot of the time, but not always and get the bump up because you're a good participant, right? So that's why I said it's not an attendance requirement. It's a participation requirement. Um, um, are there questions about that? Okay. Uh, so metaphysics exercises. So what these are is they're like, um, each one has like three multiple choice questions. Um, and uh, you do it using the quizzes tool on Canvas. I mean, it's not really a quiz, like it's not timed or whatever, but it's like, that's it's it's canvas considers it to be a quiz. <laughs> um, there's three multiple choice questions. There's a total of I think twelve of them for this course. I don't remember, maybe more. But anyway, so there there will be one. There will be one due most weeks. Some weeks two are due. Some weeks none are due. It's, um, and they they cover the material. They're supposed to cover the material that I have already lectured about. 
So in other words, it'd be a reading and then I'll have a lecture about it. And then the questions that cover that material are, are due like the next week. Um, uh, historically, people have found them very difficult, actually. I keep trying to make them easier. <laughs> um, I have them both in this course. I haven't caught... I used to teach this course all the time, uh, but I haven't taught it for six years. So I, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what state the metaphysics exercises for this course are in. Um, I know for, I also do them for 100C and those I've been like working, working, working to try to make them easier, but people still find them really hard. Um, don't, but like, don't worry about that in terms of the grade because the, they're, you know, they'll be heavily, curved, right? So in other words, basically, uh, I look at the end of the quarter, I look at the scores that people got. And I say, okay, like the most common grade should be A minus and B plus, and then, like, you know, like tail off on either end. So, um, so like, if, if most people only got half of them right, then that's probably been Half right is probably an A minus or a B plus. <laughs> hey, so don't think like, oh, it's 50% I'm failing or something like that. In fact, I, I don't think anyone has ever failed the metaphysics exercises except by literally just not doing them, <laughs> which would not, which isn't a smart thing to do, obviously. <laughs> uh, so like some people have, you know, got like one right in the whole quarter and they got like a C for that part of the grade, <laughs> right? So, um, so you should definitely do them. Um, I mean, the idea behind them, the reason that we, the reason I started doing this years ago is that, like the idea behind them is supposed to be to help you do the reading and understand the lecture. Um, I still think that it's good for that, even though it's hard. I mean, the reason it's hard is because like a lot of them turn on the proper use of terminology and stuff like that. Um, so that's what I'm trying to get you to focus on. Um, and paying attention to that is really important when reading philosophy, especially the particular like flavor of philosophy we're reading in this course. Right? Like I mean, if you're reading Nietzsche, I wouldn't say the most important thing is to keep track of proper, you know, terminology, <laughs> or, but, um, but for these people, it's super important. Um, okay, so, and those all together are worth 35% of the grade. So, so again, you should do like each individual question isn't worth that much. Plus you can get a passing grade and not get very many right, <laughs> but the whole thing put together is 35% of the grade. So you should definitely do it. Um, Okay, so other than that, there's two short papers. These, the, the two short papers are not even really papers. They're kind of like, um, um, again, like exercises in writing. So the first one is gonna be to take a very short passage in Descartes and I give a selection of them and to um, explain what the argument is give an objection and then say how Descartes would answer the objection. <laughs> That's the sign. Um, so it doesn't need like a introductory paragraph and, you know, from the beginning of time, philosophers have wondered about. <laughs> I, um, uh, and the the second one on Spinoza is a similar type of of exercise. Um, then the final paper, which is longer, um, do I really want to make that six to eight pages? I guess so. I don't know. Um, anyway, so I mean that one is actually a paper, right? So it's supposed to have a thesis, and you're supposed to argue for the thesis and whatever. And I'll talk more about the assignment when it gets closer to being due, but there's also a preliminary assignment that goes with the final paper, which is um, 
to write a first paragraph and outline of the paper. And that's due one week before the paper itself is due. And the idea is that should, you should be able to get feedback. Now, like when I first had, came up with this idea, it was gonna be written feedback, but um, various TAs suggested that it would be better to do it this way, which is that um, there'll be like special section meetings to, just to, to discuss people's outlines and, and final and first paragraphs. And like, you don't have to use that first paragraph in the paper and you don't definitely don't have to follow that outline. I mean, part of the point of this is that like maybe in between you can get a better idea about how to organize the paper. I, I do this in lieu of having like a draft due like a full draft of the paper, I feel like this is only 10 weeks. And if you're supposed to have a draft due before the end of the course, that would mean that like you couldn't write about anything that happened in the last part of the course. So, um, but I feel like this is, could be useful. And I, I hope it's, it's useful. I mean, I know often when I read papers, I get to the last paragraph and I'm like, this should have been the thesis, <laughs> right? So the hope is that at least it can catch some low hanging fruit like that. Um, um, okay, right. So all those assignments, as I said, are already available. That is, except the metaphysics exercises are already available online. Papers will be handed in via Canvas. I have to remember to add them to, right? So the assignment is not on Canvas but you have to hand them in by via a Canvas assignment. So I have to set those up. Um, okay, plagiarism. I used to always just say, please don't plagiarize <laughs> and move on. There's been more plagiarism in recent years. I'm not sure why, maybe it had something to do with the pandemic. Uh, I, and of course, now there's the issue of having ChatGPT write your paper. I have seen some papers that I'm pretty sure were written by ChatGPT, although I couldn't prove it. <laughs> um, I mean, I've used ChatGPT enough that I like, I recognize its style. <laughs> um, please don't do that. I, I mean, I don't know what to say. If it happens a lot, I'm gonna have to start like, saying, you know, I say this was written by ChatGPT and you just prove it <laughs> or something. But um, <laughs> yeah, but it's, you know, it's good, but it's not the kind of thing it would be good at answering. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I like chat GPT. I use it for lots of stuff, actually. I mean, you, you have to be careful because a lot of the times it says something wrong, <laughs> but it's really useful. Uh, it's not in its current form. It, it, it wouldn't write a good paper for this course. <laughs> Definitely not. The problem is that I'm not accustomed to taking papers that are not very good and saying this fails. Right. So, in fact, what I was about to say is that, like, I think the only reason I've ever failed a paper that someone actually handed in was because I caught them plagiarizing. <laughs> right. So, you know, so the problem is that ChatGPT could write a really crappy paper for this course. And, but I would still say, okay, this is a, I guess it's a B minus, you know, or something like that. Right. And, and that would be bad. You know, I, so yeah, please don't do that. And please don't do the other kind of plagiarism either. I mean, I get like, you know, pay attention when I just said, I never failed papers on this, I catch them plagiarizing. You're, you're better off writing a lousy paper and <laughs> you don't have time to do anything else. You know, so, or, you know, or you can write a paper that's like, and this would be a really bad paper, right? But you could write a paper that's mostly quotes from Wikipedia, but you put them in quotation marks and you have a footnote <laughs> and then it's not plagiarism, right? So, all right. Um, 
I, again, I don't recommend doing that, but it's better than plagiarizing. <laughs> right. Okay. And similarly, you could do that with ChatGPT, right? So it says here AI policy. I encourage the use of AI assistance with proper caution. That is keeping in mind that current AI is often wrong. You may use AI assistance basically in any way that would not constitute cheating if you used a human for the same thing. That's that that's I I don't know how to be more precise than that. Maybe in the future I'll have to find a way to be more precise. But you know, so like if you went to the library and asked the librarian, you know, what would be some good books to read about X? That's not cheating, and you don't have to cite them, right? So you could do that with ChatGPT. You know, if you if you use it in a way where if a human did it, you would have to cite the human, then you should cite ChatGPT, right? Like if you say, could you come up with a good first paragraph for me? <laughs> then you would have to say where that paragraph came from if it was a human. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, they would have to, you would have to have a huge list of programmers. Um, I, so, um, in general, I don't have a like required format for for footnotes and references. So my answer is whatever, you know, as long as I can tell what it is you're citing, right? And I mean, so like philosophy journals, in some fields, there's a like really well accepted format that everyone uses. And you and part of learning to be in the field is to learn that format. But in philosophy, that's not really too true. Every journal has its own thing. So I don't see any purpose in trying to, you know, require something. As long as I or that is or the TA can tell what it is you're citing and find it if we need to, then that's that's fine. Did you have a question? Or, yeah. uh, I was just going to ask if you want, this probably falls under, I can't think of, uh, but if you want, you want specifically to the like, essay body, like like MLA or anything like that, or something like that. Are there different formats for the essay body? I think you just write like paragraphs. And stuff. I don't know. <laughs> Do I? Yeah. Well, do I care? I mean, so it's true, the assignment is in number of pages. And so of course we all know that means that, and not, you don't even have to change the, the um, points of the font. You could like, if you know how to do it, you could like change the spacing between the letters or whatever. <laughs> um, basically like those, I mean, so the, the TAs are going to be grading the papers, but I, I can say that at least when I read a paper, I, like the first thing I do isn't count and see how many pages it is. I just like, if I read it and it seems like there isn't that much there, that's when I start looking at, you know. So, the, I mean, basically those page numbers are like a guide to how much of a paper is being asked for here. And um, I mean, moreover, if like, if you're like the next Wittgenstein or something, maybe you would write a paper that was like three sentences long and I'd be like, oh my God. <laughs> um, right, so I, you know, um, so therefore again, just like don't bother to do that. If your paper is, you know, like five and five eighths pages, don't like waste a lot of time shifting the margins or whatever. <laughs> But if your paper is like three pages, then it's probably not enough of a paper. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, okay. All assignments are due by 11.55 p.m. on the due date. This is also something I added over the years because I used to just write the due date, but then students would be like, well, what time is it due? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so, okay, by midnight, you know, but then people were like, midnight, does that mean the beginning of the next day or that? So like, okay, 11.55. <laughs> All right. Um, and the last thing it says here is attendance at lecture is strongly encouraged, but not a course requirement. I already said that. Okay. Are there questions about course requirements? Yeah. 
Okay, so texts. So I'm doing this weird thing. I sent an email out about it, which I hope you got. Right? It's called inclusive access. I'm not sure if it's really a scam by the publisher or if it's actually a good thing. <laughs> so especially towards the end of the course, I you know if you have an opinion about that, you should let me know. Um, but like so, basically the way it works is I understand it, although I haven't used it from the student end. Um, I was actually on the committee. I, I used to be chair of the library committee. And then I also got involved in the committee that chose the vendor for the bookstore. Um, and so I got various descriptions of it then, but I've never used it. <laughs> but anyway, like I think, so the way it works is that basically everyone has like, will be charged for the eBooks if you don't do anything and you'll get access to them. If you uh, don't want to use the ebooks, then you have to opt out. Um, and uh, the ebooks are supposedly the same edition as the editions that are listed here. I don't know if the pagination is the same though. Yeah. I don't know, but. The... 44 to rent and then like 80 to buy, I think. Not much. Of for all three, I guess, but still. for all of them. I mean, I assume the Descartes one. No, actually, that's not true. The Spinoza one is Hackett, but I, I don't the other two might be more expensive. The Hackett one English. Yeah. Um, but uh I mean there are public domain versions of these texts and there's links to them on the syllabus the translation won't be the same um and the pagination well like i said i don't know if how the pagination is going to work with these ebooks uh but um there's also uh i mean some of the Leibniz stuff might be a little bit hard to find that way um just because what Leibniz wrote is mostly a lot of little fragments and stuff, and there's different collections of them, and you're not going to find a, a public domain collection that has exactly the same. But um, um, so like so that's a way you could go if you don't want to buy the books at all. <laughs> um, uh, if it were me, I would probably. No, I don't know. These days I kind of like having ebooks. But anyway, so uh, if you have more questions about that and how it works, I probably won't be able to answer them, but I can like refer to the, I can contact the person at the bookstore who knows the answer. Um, um, these translations are not, so like, first of all, all translations of philosophy are really bad, basically. <laughs> Like, I mean, like, number one, there's a limit to how good they can be. Philosophy is really hard to translate. It's almost as hard to translate as poetry. I mean, it depends which philosopher, but they're, they're but but they're all pretty, pretty hard to translate. Um, and moreover, most translations that are out there don't get very close to that limit. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, like these translations are not necessarily the best possible translation. Uh, they're just, they're the ones that I've used for years. And so like, they're the ones I'm gonna be quoting when I, in lecture and whatever. Um, and I guess I should also mention, there's also links. Um, I shouldn't mention illegal ways you might get access to the text. <laughs> All right. Um, there's also links on the syllabus to, uh, um, and why don't I have this for the, for Descartes? Uh, I should add it for Descartes as well. I don't know why I didn't have it, but there's, do you know what LibriVox is? It's like public domain texts read by volunteers and the, the recordings are in the public domain. And they have a lot of stuff. 
the, I mean, the quality is variable. It depends on who's reading it, but it's actually often pretty good. Um, so, um, uh, I mean, I probably wouldn't recommend if you've never read something before, just using the audio version, but maybe for some people that would be good. I don't know. Um, I mean, I love to listen to the reading I'm going to lecture about in the car on the way to Berkeley. <laughs> um, anyway, there's links to that too, except for Descartes, which I'll add a link. Um, okay, I think I've covered all of that type of stuff. Anything else I wrote here? I don't think so. Are there are there any questions about that like administrative stuff? Yes. What do you think makes the translation of philosophy good or bad? <laughs> um well again, it depends somewhat on what philosopher you're talking about, but um but the basic, yeah, the basic issue is about the terminology. And you know, I mean, it can be really important. First of all, just within a given philosopher, it can be really important. Like, is the same word being used here that's being used over here? Um, and it's, you know, a, and it, it's hard to preserve that when you translate. <laughs> um, the more you do it, the harder it is to read the translation. Like the 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 less it reads, like like reading a newspaper article or something, right? Like the more you have to think. Wait, what what did they actually mean by this word? Not what we usually mean by it. But that's good. That's what you have. That's what you should be doing when you read philosophy. Right? Um, so, uh, um, but moreover, there's issues, you know, between different philosophers. Right. So like, you know, you want to know whether someone is thinks they're they're alluding to Aristotle or not. If you, like if you're reading a translation of Aristotle that, you know, tries to make Aristotle sound like it was written in Oxford in 1940 or whatever, you know, and you're reading a translation of Kant that tries to make it sound like it was written in, uh, you know, Indiana in 1980 and you know like uh and they, they they choose the word in contemporary English they think will give you the first like if you read like really quickly and superficially they want they get the best impression right so they'll like substance no one knows what that means let's translate it as you know real thing or something like that, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, and then Kant says substance and they translate that some other way and you're left not knowing that Kant is talking about the same thing as Aristotle. And, you know, and it can be really important when Kant is giving a list of categories <laughs> and, and the idea of a list of categories starts with Aristotle and, you, you know, right, so, uh, but, so like trying to do that, making it easy to determine what words are in the original and um, and what their historical connections are is what makes a translation good in my view. But like I said, it's, I mean, like medieval translations of Aristotle into Arabic and Latin went pretty far in this direction. And they like distorted the whole target language, basically, you know, like changed the grammar <laughs> or translations of Arabic into Latin. Also, those are the three big roots there, right? So, um, um, and, you know, people were expected to learn to read this special kind of Latin. <laughs> I guess like we can't really ask people to do that anymore, learn to read a special kind of English. So, but yeah, anyway, so that's why there's only so far you can go. There's William of Morbeck, who was one of the most important translators of Aristotle from Greek into Latin, actually at one point, this is a real tangent. Should I talk about this? 
<laughs> I just tell you, in Latin, there are no articles, right? Like there's no indefinite article and no definite article. In Greek, there's no indefinite article, but there is a definite article. And the definite article is important because it's philosophically important because it's used to form what's called articular infinitive, which is where you take the infinitive of a verb and you put the definite article before it and it makes it into a noun, right? So like Aristotle will say, ta ainai, so literally that means the, and then that's the infinitive of the verb to be. <laughs> so people tried various ways of, of, you know, rendering this in Latin, like just using the Latin infinitive essay or, you know, whatever. But um, William of Morbeck decided that this was no good. And he just started using the French definite article in his Latin translations from Greek. <laughs> In his later, you know, you could see the development in his later translations. He just said, okay, le, <laughs> le essay or whatever. <laughs> um, right. Uh, anyway, sorry, that was a tangent. Um, it, were there more questions? Because I still want to actually give an overview of what the course is about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Class that probably means there is no summing. <laughs> there is an eight Yes. That probably means at one point there was an eight and I and there was a seven and I got rid of the seven for some reason and then I yeah. Okay. Anyway, if it's not don't you won't be marked down for not doing a metaphysics exercise that is not there's no link to. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh Okay, and yes. Do you guys know that now? Yeah. Um, Monday and Wednesday, we need to sum up, and then um, well, okay. Wednesday and Thursday, then we need to sum up. Thank you. Yeah. Um, anything else? Okay, so. Um, Okay, so what is this course about? Um, well, it's about the rationalist. I wish I could turn this light on. Don't see a switch. All right, I'm not gonna waste more time on that. Yeah, I know there's a million switches over there and I tried them before. Mm -hmm. This is the right and bottom of the chalkboard. Is that a button? This is this button? No, around the left button. So there is a button on the like small wall, right to the right, and then up of the chalkboard. Is that a button for the? No, it isn't. No. Dang it! There's a second thing that's blue. I don't know that is. No, this is like a Ethernet. Oh, I was assuming that up meant yeah, up is normal. Yeah, all right. Okay. Right. So this course is about the rationalists. Who are the rationalists? So a uh, brief history of Western philosophy. <laughs> um, by the way, in the back of the syllabus is, uh, what's the back? In the back of the syllabus is a bonus timeline of the history of Western philosophy. <laughs> um, and um, um, because as I'll say, explain in a moment, we're gonna start, so, um, those three texts I talk about, are, I mentioned are for most of the course, but the first three readings are these like PDFs that I've put up on Canvas. And they're, um, is the first three or the first two? I have to change everything. Well, whatever. Anyway. Yeah. So the first three readings, and well, I'll say why, right? So like, here's the history of Western philosophy. So this is like 500 BC. One, 
because there is no year zero, 500, 1,000, too much. Too much. All right. So, um, Aristotle died in three twenty two BC. That's like year. And Descartes published the meditations in 1641. So like if ancient philosophy, if you think of ancient philosophy as basically Plato and Aristotle, and modern philosophy is starting with the meditations, <laughs> <laughs> everything else happens in between. <laughs> right. So, like, this is 100A. Now, I mean, that's a little bit unfair. I know the way John Bowen teaches 100A, um, he does do some of, uh, like, this stuff. Hellenistic period philosophy, like the Stoics. Um, what? Scotus. Right. So, Scotus is here. <laughs> Thomas Aquinas is like, you know, right? Like we're much closer to them than they are to Aristotle, actually. <laughs> um, but um, um, right. Thomas Th Thomas Aquinas died in twelve seventy four. <laughs> yeah. So in that period, rationalist philosophy didn't get developed. Well, so I'm about to explain. But I'm 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 about to like try to put this in context, right? So like what, because rationalist philosophy, it doesn't mean philosophers who are especially rational, <laughs> right? And the others are like irrational. Um, it doesn't even mean philosophers who believe that you should be rational as opposed to like fideists or like something, right? Like philosophers who give all kinds of rational arguments why you shouldn't have to be rational, <laughs> right? Um, uh, it, um, it's, so it really it refers to a specific school of philosophy in the early modern period. So like sometime in here, or I'll say more precisely what the period is. Um, so like almost by definition, it didn't happen in any of these other periods. <laughs> um, but what I want to explain is like why there was a school at this time that was called rationalists and why we have a course about it. Yeah. Let's say 1891. 1641. Yeah, what are you supposed to do that date, Mark? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, memorize all the dates on this. No, no, no. <laughs> no, look, I mean, how do you, how do you think I made this? Well, yeah, like I, what the way I made it is I'm like, okay, go to Wikipedia, <laughs> Descartes. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, probably having these dates memorized would be useful for some purposes, but I don't do it. So, um, right. Um, so, so what happened in this long period in between Aristotle and Descartes? Um, so for a big part of it, the answer is that it was dominated by two schools of philosophy, which kind of merged into each other. The one is Aristotelianism. And the other is what we call Neoplatonism. But they didn't call themselves Neoplatonists, they call themselves Platonists. <laughs> um, so, um, and the reason, I mean, the, so the Neoplatonists said, like, we're not followers of Aristotle, we're followers of Plato. But then they read a lot of Aristotle and used Aristotle to try to understand what Plato meant. <laughs> so their Plato uh, is has a lot of Aristotle in it. <laughs> Um, and 
that school of Neoplatonism, um, why am I having trouble with this? Yeah. All right. So Plotinus was the founder. Well, supposedly he had his teacher, Ammonius Sacchus, but uh, like we don't know anything about what. So for our purposes, Plotinus is the founder. Plotinus died in the year 270. The reason I'm using the death is because it's closer to when they did most of their work than the birth, right? <laughs> right. So um, Plotinus died in the year 270. Um, and um, his school of Neoplatonism plus the more like Aristotelian Aristotelians, um, the peripatetics, as they call themselves, um, dominated the late period of ancient philosophy. Right, so this is the period that's usually called late antiquity. During late antiquity, before that, I mean, Aristotle wasn't actually, I mean, people read Aristotle for sure, but Aristotle wasn't actually all that prominent for most of this in-between period, you know, right? He was just one among many things, you know, there were Stoics and skeptics and whatever. So the domination of Aristotle really starts in late antiquity with, um, as I said, the Neoplatonists and the peripatetics. Um, and then later Neoplatonists became more and more like um, the theory grew that Aristotle and Plato really agreed about everything and that they just expressed it differently. <laughs> um, so, um, so, I mean, we'll be reading a little, very little bit of this stuff. And then, of course, there was right the fall of the Western Empire in the beginning of the, the Dark Ages. Um, and the Eastern Empire continued, right? The, the Eastern Empire, that what we call the Byzantine Empire, lasted until 1453, I think, or something. Yeah, 1453. See, I do have something that's memorized. Oh, but, uh, but the initial period of the Byzantine Empire was also kind of dark ages, like not much was written, and, you know, things were in a bad state, I guess. Um, and um, Latin philosophy didn't really pick up again until starting like in the 11th century. I mean, there were some things, you know, like St. Anselm of Canterbury, and everyone knows his ontological proof and whatever. But 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 Latin philosophy was, you know, I mean, first of all, very little uh, ancient Greek philosophy was available in Latin. They had a little bit, and they had some of the Timaeus, I think, and uh, like the logical, the Organon of Aristotle, the logical books in Latin, but they had very little else and they didn't know how to read Greek anymore. So um, so like very little was going on. But what happened was um, so uh, it started, I guess, I don't know, maybe this is making it sound too dramatic. Like there probably were a lot of routes by which it happened, but it especially started with a group of Christian peripatetics in Baghdad sometime around the eighth or ninth century, um, started translating Aristotle from, well, first there were translations of Aristotle into Syriac, which is a kind of Aramaic, which which the um, a lot of these people spoke. And th but then later there were a lot of translations either directly from Greek or sometimes by way of Syriac into Arabic. Um, and that's how the Arabic Middle Ages of, got started, as far as philosophy goes. Um, and um, I saw recently, I, I saw a history of philosophy. I forget by who I was by. It was published recently. And, you know, I was looking at the table of contents. 
and I saw, well, this is weird. It's, it lists like Augustine, and then it lists like Thomas Aquinas, right? So again, Augustine, Augustine was pretty much of a Neoplatonist of some kind. He lived also in this period, right? Um, you know, and then it was like Thomas Aquinas, and like, what happened to the medieval Arab philosophers? Well, I found out that they were in, there was like a kind of appendix on non-Western philosophy. And under non-Western philosophy, they had the, you know, because they, they're, because they're Arabs, they're not Western, right? Well, like, I don't know who's Western and who's not, but Arabic medieval philosophy is part of the history of Western philosophy. They're Aristotelian. I mean, some of them are, you know, there's some who are like anti-Aristotelian, but the but the mainstream is like in and not so they're Aristotelians. And um the when Latin medieval philosophy gets started again in the high Middle Ages, the so first of all, the first translations of Aristotle they get are from Arabic into Latin. And they come with the commentary of, of Averroes, who the, the Latins call the commentator. <laughs> okay. So um, later they got them directly translated from Greek, but um, um, they looked at those people, especially Avicenna and Averroes, as like um, almost as important as Aristotle. I mean, I shouldn't put it quite that way. Aristotle is definitely a, a higher authority and these people you can disagree with and they do disagree with them about a lot of things. But but like if you read Thomas Aquinas or John Duns Scotus or William of Ockham, like these people are mentioned like every other sentence. It's not, it, it's not like there's some obscure un underground connection by which like some Arabic tradition reached Europe. These are like the most important people whose, whose opinions you always have to bring up. Um, so, um, right, so that's what, so here we had like Arabic philosophy. And then, so, I mean, I think, um, being, I guess, kind of a descendant of the Latin West myself, <laughs> not of the Byzantine, like the Greek East or the, or the Arabic East and South, right? Well, I mean, Spain isn't East or South of <laughs> Europe, but anyway, uh, Averroes lived in Spain. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, I tend to kind of think of, of of philosophy in Arabic is petering out in the later Middle Ages. I, I think that's true to some extent, but it's but but it's that's a big oversimplification, especially I think in in Shia countries like Iran, there's you know, I, I think like this this tradition in some sense continues to this day. But um, but from a Euro, more Eurocentric or Western Eurocentric viewpoint, kind of we kind of the, the scene shifts <laughs> from Arabic to Latin sometime in here. Um, and um, what I was saying before I interrupted myself with like 15 minutes of stuff about the history of philosophy was that these people were basically Aristotelians. What does it mean that they're Aristotelians? Well, um, by the way, I guess I should say one other thing about this. Sometimes you hear people say that um, two things that are actually contradict each other about this, this period of philosophy. One is that, well, all they really did was preserve Aristotle. Right, so they, they, you know, what? So people are like, oh, we owe them a great debt because they preserved Aristotle. Um, I mean, first of all, that's not literally true, right? Like the, all the Aristotelian texts that we have were preserved in Greek in the Byzantine Empire. That's how they were able to get translations directly from Greek. Um, but um, 
But I guess if you mean like they preserve the tradition of Aristotelian philosophy, that's probably true. I think the Byzantines were more Platonist. I don't know too much about Byzantine philosophy. Um, but um, but th there's nothing creative about it, is the implication, right? But then on the other hand, you'll hear people say, well, these Arabic philosophers, um, their Aristotle isn't the real Aristotle. They read it in such a weird way. So like I said, those two things contradict each other. Either they just preserved it or they, so I mean, the truth is that they were Aristotelians of pretty much the same kind as these people and these people, these Latin people, which means, so what it means to be an Aristotelian is that Aristotle is an authority. So like, um, you can sometimes disagree with Aristotle. There's specific points where it's traditional to disagree with Aristotle, like about the eternity of the world, for example, right? So, but basically you want to almost never disagree with Aristotle. And um, if you do think that Aristotle is wrong, you better have a good explanation of why he made a mistake, right? Because he's not going to make a stupid mistake, <laughs> right? So, um, so you want to agree with Aristotle. So all these people agree with Aristotle, but they don't agree with each other. <laughs> so how is that possible? Because they don't agree about what Aristotle means, right? So when they argue with each other, they're both arguing about what's true and what's false, and also at the same time arguing about the proper interpretation of Aristotle. Um, And like part of the, the the those these short readings that I've chosen for the first three is to like give you some sense of what that was like. <laughs> um, it's I mean to a certain extent I think philosophy is always like that. That's why I was emphasizing that thing about making sure you know when someone intends to use the same terminology. Um, uh, it's you know. Even for like contemporary analytic philosophers, it's a point in favor of what you're saying if you can show that that like um, I mean it's the range is narrow, right? But if you can show that you know David Lewis or Dummett or someone that like you can explain their position better because of what you're saying, that's a point in its favor, right? That's that's a way of saying that those those texts are authoritative. It's, yeah. What role did Christianity play in the merging of Aristotelianism and Neoplatonism? Uh, that's a good question. I feel like the... I feel like the answer is That is Christianity it, when it started to like with Augustine started to produce philosophical work pretty much was already presented with that. I don't think that was prompted by Christianity. And then like these later people like Thomas Aquinas. So Thomas Aquinas, you know, I mean, he has to juggle. He, he wants to agree with Augustine. But Augustine is like much more Platonist than Thomas Aquinas has inherited this more strictly Aristotelian tradition. So, so, so he has to respond by really distorting his interpretation of Augustine. <laughs> um, so, um, I don't know. If, I don't know if that all put together answers what you're asking or not. I mean, but I'm not sure if that's the if that's the whole answer to that. I mean, I think you know, to a certain extent, Neoplatonism and Christianity were like Neoplatonism, Christianity, Gnosticism were all kind of like had similar ideas and they were floating around at the same time and things went both ways between them, probably. Is Kabbalah in that mix somewhere? 
Kabbalah as we know it is much later. Yeah, there's old ones that allegedly neoplatonism and has a relation to Kabbalah, but I don't know if that's true. Well, there's a lot of different Kabbalists. Uh, the more philosophical ones, some. I, I It's probably more tied to Gnosticism than Neoplatonism, but... Um, you know, like this idea that something has gone wrong in the creation, right? Like that's, Neoplatonists don't think that, right? Neoplatonists think that this world is the, like, you know, there's like a straight emanation from, from the good, just the one beyond being <laughs> down to us. And like, um, the only thing that's bad about this world is it's not better, <laughs> right? Whereas, um, Whereas Gnostics and Kabbalists tend to think that something broke during the, the creation of the world or like somehow evil powers ended up in charge of the world or, you know, what about whatever. the cave though in this case? What? What about the cave? Like we're stuck in the cave that after the disaster? That would be a Gnostic interpretation of the allegory of the cave, which there were. <laughs> Um, right. Anyway, sorry, this is kind of getting off track because I haven't even got to, <laughs> to the period this course is actually about. <laughs> so, right. But so what I want to say is, so it, then at some point, Aristotelianism, and now, I mean, you can tell by my saying that what a huge oversimplification that must be, right? <laughs> like, and then we got the early modern period, right? So this is like late antiquity. This is like the Arabic Middle Ages, the, the, the Latin Middle Ages or the High Middle Ages. By the time I was reading a book about the High Middle Ages and my roommate, it was like a CS major, was like, oh wow, that must have been the best part of the Middle Ages. The high Middle Ages. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, so, um, and then the Middle Ages ended and well, there was like the Renaissance or whatever, but forget that and, <laughs> Then there was the early modern period. So the early modern period begins, well, I mean, it depends who you ask. Like some people would say that modern philosophy begins with Machiavelli, which is quite a bit earlier than Descartes, right? Um, some people would say that modern philosophy begins with Bacon. Um, but at least, these days, we usually seem to think of it as starting with Descartes. Um, so but this date, 1641, the publication of the Meditations is kind of a start date of early modern philosophy. And early modern philosophy ends with the publication of the Critique of Pure Reason. So that's 1781. These are not to scale, really. This is to scale. <laughs> um, right, so this is the theory that, that we call early modern philosophy. And then afterwards, you get like modern, modern philosophy, <laughs> later modern philosophy. Um, and so these people in this period basically have in common with each other that they're anti-Aristotelian. So what that means is um, what that means is that they reject the authority of Aristotle. Right, so like I was emphasizing, when I to call these people Aristotelians is not to say that they all agree with each other about everything. They don't. They right. They don't agree with each other about almost anything. Um, but they agree that Aristotle is an authority, and these people agree that Aristotle is not an authority. Um. In fact, to some extent, although we'll see a big change in this as we move from Descartes to Spinoza to Leibniz, especially, um, to some extent, these people 
um, re are re trying to reject the idea of philosophical authority, right? That is to say, there can't be an authority in philosophy. Um, it's tricky because philosophy, like, always has maintained that. Right? Like you can quote Aristotle. So like the Latin medievals will quote Aristotle. Now this actually is not a real Aristotelian text, although Aristotle says something similar, but th that they attribute it to Aristotle. Um, um, uh, amicus Platon said, magis amicus veritas. <laughs> Right, like Plato is dear or is a friend, but the truth is more dear. <laughs> um, right, so you can quote Aristotle's authority for that, meaning that like there are there is no authority. <laughs> right, that's you you quote that when you say when you're saying that like even though I think that so and so is a great. Philosopher, I'm going to disagree with them because the truth is more dear, right? So, um, uh, but somehow, in a way that I wish I could explain better, the issue doesn't come to a head in the Middle Ages the way it does in the early modern period. And so, I mean, we'll see right away in the first thing we read by Descartes that a lot of it is about explaining why he can't follow the authority of texts and he has to sit down and think for himself. <laughs> um, now, I mean, so that's number one, what it means when I say that they're anti aristotelian It's also true that they disagree with Aristotle and Aristotelians about certain things. Um, But it also means paradoxically that um, they end up using a lot of Aristotelian terminology and conceptual apparatus because like to, to directly disagree with a philosopher usually means that you have to actually have a lot in common with them. <laughs> Right, like they say X and you say not X, and therefore you both agree that X is something that is well formulated and makes sense, which is a huge amount of agreement in philosophy, <laughs> right? Because that's usually what we disagree about. So, um, um, so they put their views, and we'll see this also in Descartes. That at the same time as he's saying, you know, I'm throwing off the, the authority of Aristotle, he puts his views in Aristotelian terminology. And so, like, that's, I guess, like, the reason why I included a little bit, there's many reasons why I included a little bit of reading from this long period at the beginning of the course. One is just because none of our other courses cover it, right? Like 100A is here and 100B starts here. Um, one is that I wanted to try to give some feeling of what philosophy was like, what was done this way. But one is that um, it's hard to understand what these people are saying if you don't know what certain terms like substance and accident and whatever meant in the original Aristotelian context, because they assume you know that. So, um... Okay, so that's the early modern period. And so we have two courses that cover the early modern period. 100B, which is this course, the rationalists. 100C, which is the empiricists. So why is that? Um, well, okay, so first of all, basically one thing that these people disagree with Aristotelians about is um, what mental powers are the basis of knowledge? Like, what is it, what do we use to, to gain knowledge? So Aristotelians agree, although they mean different things by it, but they agree because Aristotle says it, that you need two things. You need sense, the senses and, you, and reason or intellect. 
You put those two things together and that's where all human knowledge comes from. Yeah. Um, and Hans, as he does on actually many issues, like tries to reestablish that. Right, so it's like if you take 106, was me next quarter. Like Kant starts by saying, all our knowledge draws from these two sources: reason, I mean, uh, the senses and understanding or intellect. But in between, these people um, said, "No, you only need one of those. Only one of them contributes to knowledge." They didn't deny that we have the other capability as well, but they said it has a secondary use or whatever. Um, however, they disagreed about which faculty it is, <laughs> right? Which capability it is that, that all our knowledge is based on. And so as you could probably guess, these who are reading in whatever it be are the ones who says knowledge is based on reason. These who said are the ones who said all knowledge derives from the senses. Um, and Kant, looking back over his predecessors, classified them this way, <laughs> said they're both wrong. In fact, he said they both make kind of the same mistake. Um, and I'm going to fix it by putting the two pieces back together. Um, and Kant was so influential that basically every, after him, everyone thought of the people in this period as empiricists and rationalists. Um, they themselves didn't, you know, use that, those terms, and they didn't necessarily think of themselves in exactly those groups. I mean, these people were British. Um, that already like conceals the difference between English and Scottish, which may be important. <laughs> but um, these people were continental. Well, I mean, they thought of themselves as French and German and Dutch. Those are the three people we're reading, right? Descartes was French, Spinoza was Dutch, and Leibniz was German. They didn't necessarily think of themselves as continental. <laughs> um, and there were a lot of other issues besides this one issue of empiricism versus rationalism. Moreover, there were some British people like Hobbes who, like Hobbes is not really an empiricist. Um, I'm not gonna argue for that now, but... <laughs> um, if, if I teach 144, I'm my argument for that. Um, so, uh, um, so like this classification is, you know, it's a little bit external. Nevertheless, I actually think it's pretty good. I mean, first of all, Kant was, you know, fortunately was, I mean, I guess not a coincidence. Fortunately, the person who had so much influence was actually pretty good. <laughs> right. So Kant actually was, you know, um, has has a lot of insight into what the important things are that are going on in this period. And so this way of classifying people is um useful. Um and so I don't think it's a bad thing that this is that that we follow this. Kantian classification in the way we set up our courses. But um, but it is worth keeping in mind that it's, you know, um, there could be other ways of doing it. Um, and that's especially true because, so this disagreement about the sources of our knowledge is a disagreement in the branch of philosophy that we now call epistemology. Now the word epistemology itself is from the 19th century. So like um, none of these people use the word epistemology to describe what they're doing, but they were doing what we call epistemology, right? So epistemology is the branch of philosophy um, that studies uh, what, if anything, we can know and how 
we can know it. Um, so, so this disagreement of, between rationalists and empiricists, strictly speaking, is a disagreement in epistemology. It's also related to another part of philosophy. Now, this word is ancient, um, metaphysics. Um, although there's been a lot of disagreement about what exactly metaphysics is during the history of philosophy. Um, the, way we, the way we usually use the word now is, the way I'm gonna use it is, that it's the part of philosophy that that deals on the most with on the most fundamental level with what kind of things there are and what their first pr principles and causes are. Right. So it's about like ontology, what kind of things exist, um, but also fundamental issues about causation and stuff like that. Um, these two things, you know, at least should have a really tight relationship with each other. Both ways, because on the one hand, um, if you have a certain, if you have a theory about what kind of things there are, um, so one of those things is going to be human beings. <laughs> and um, your metaphysics be, better a, be able to explain how things like that can get knowledge. Right? So it, is, it better be consistent with your epistemology in that sense. Right? You have to be able to explain, for example, if you think that we get knowledge through our senses and that sensing something is being affected by it, then human beings better be the kind of things that can be affected by other things that are external to them, which, for example, Leibniz is going to deny. <laughs> so, um, so Leibniz couldn't, like Leibniz's metaphysics wouldn't go with an empiricist epistemology. Um, and on the other hand, they, there's a relationship the other way, right? Like if you say, these are the kinds of things there are in the world and whatever, you better be able to explain how, if that were true, it'd be possible to know it, <laughs> right? So if you claim that there's all kinds of immaterial beings and whatever, and then you say, and then you say the only way, way we know about things is through the senses, <laughs> then you have you have your work cut out for you trying to explain how we could. I mean, people are laughing. Like, I mean, you can do this maybe, but it's going to be hard, right? Like you have to explain how you can know things indirectly, et cetera, right? So, uh, what's that? It's the deist argument, isn't it? The deist argument. Uh, well, you can infer basically the Christian doctrine of God purely from the evidence of the creation. I wouldn't call that the deist argument, but, but yeah, I mean, various proofs of the existence of God are like that. Yes. Um, some are not. Um, well, discussing Descartes' are proofs of the existence of God, well, and Spinoza and Leibniz. Uh, Spinoza ends up to be really simple because he he proves that nothing exists except God. God. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it actually ends up to be really easy to prove that God exists. Uh, but um, anyway. Um, uh, but, um, so, I mean, these people are rationalists, right? So their arguments are not based on the, the senses, but they are based on the existence of the world. Um, the existence of the world and perhaps the nature of the world specifically, right? Those are two different ways to go. Those are what Kant calls cosmological proofs and physico- theological proofs. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. Um, the point is, so these two things go together. Um, in some philosophers, metaphysics comes first and then epistemology. In these people, it tends to be the opposite, right? So like you start with the epistemology and based on that, you explain what kind of things the world contains. Um, there's one other thing I want to mention, though, which is that 
Um, of course, these aren't the only two branches of philosophy. Um, these are the two main, or anyway, our two main branches of what's called theoretical philosophy. Right, so the distinction between theory and practice, I'm gonna be talking about this more as we go on, right? It's a distinction between theoretic, it doesn't mean exactly what you would normally think theory versus practice means. Theoretical philosophy is philosophy where the question is about like, what is true, right? Where it's like trying to find out what the world is like or what, or how, what we can know about the world or something like that. There's also what's called practical philosophy, which is basically ethics and politics. Um, right, politics in the sense of political philosophy, obviously, not in the sense of like running for office or whatever. <laughs> um, so, um, um, These people are also interested in practical philosophy. They're also interested in ethics and politics. Some more, some, you know, or check but I don't really think some more and some less, but in some it's more obvious and others it's less obvious, let me put it that way. Um, they're, they, I mean, like, how could you not care about this? The idea that, that you could be, um, a philosopher and specialize in metaphysics and um, you leave this to someone else is actually, which is what we tend to do now, is actually bizarre. <laughs> like you can't leave this to something else, someone else, <laughs> right? So anyway, so these people are interested in this side too. Um, this way of organizing the period tends to obviously focus the attention on epistemology and metaphysics less than on ethics and politics, but I'm going to try as we go through to make some of the connections clear because there, there are connections, and I mean, one of them is basically already been mentioned, the question of authority and the authority of texts. Yeah. When, when you're mentioning like uh, this Aristotelian seeing Aristotle as authority in authority or like other uh, people seeing certain philosophers as authorities. What do we mean by that? Like what exactly are they, uh, are people seeing them as authorities on? Well, they're seeing them as authorities on philosophy, right? But that means, you know, on epistemology, metaphysics, ethics, politics. Um, so, um, um, I mean, of course, that doesn't give the, like, Aristotle some kind of um, political authority in the whole society, not directly, anyway, right? Because philosophers, right, I mean, there's this, there's this kind of thought experiment in Plato's Republic where philosophers are going to rule. <laughs> but, um, um, Probably Plato's Republic is supposed to prove that the, that wouldn't really be a good idea. <laughs> but I don't, but anyway, that's uh, yeah, that what I just said is very controversial. But anyway, um, but, but it certainly hasn't actually ever happened, right? But philosophers do kind of rule over other philosophers. <laughs> so there's an internal politics of philosophy. Um, and there's and there's there's a kind of political power involved there. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. So is it almost like kind of seeing uh, a certain philosopher as like you refer to like their expertise, or I guess it's more to do with agreeing with what they say. But but I'm kind of thinking like. I imagine these people said a lot of things. So is it not kind of weird to just say, yeah, I just agree with this guy? It is kind of weird, but it's, <laughs> but on the other hand, it's 
we're kind of weird not to do that very much, <laughs> right? Like, me, uh, like we modern people are kind of weird not to do that. Um, so uh, it depends what you mean by weird, uh, right? Like, I mean, philosophy. Aristotle says philosophy begins with wonder, but ends with with, with whatever the opposite of wonder is, <laughs> right? Um, Right. So anyway, um, uh, <laughs> no. Um, uh, what was I going to say? But but I mean, I think so. Like so, like think about how the Supreme Court of the United States uses the con the Constitution. Uh, like it, it interprets the Constitution. So, and it, and it interprets it not with a scholarly interest in figuring out what it means, because if you did it that way, you would probably find out that there's no good answer, that it's not consistent, for example, right? Like I've heard, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard that one reason there have been so many arguments about the meaning of the Second Amendment is that the framers didn't agree with what they wanted to go into the amendment. And so they put in a compromise language that each one hoped would be interpreted in a certain way. Right, so the Supreme Court can't decide a case by saying that. <laughs> right, so, and they also can't decide a case by saying that the Constitution is wrong. <laughs> but they can decide in various different ways by appealing to the Constitution. And that's very roughly speaking the way these people relate to Aristotle. Right, so Aristotle can't be, you can't for the most part say that he's wrong, that he's, that if you ask, why does he say this over here and this over here, you can't say, well, because he changed his mind. <laughs> there has to be a doctrine you can put together, right? You know, so like, I hope that makes it a little bit more, a bit, little bit better picture of what they're doing. Um, well, I have actually used all the time uh, even though I said that I probably wouldn't. Um, and I don't have time left to give you any warnings about the reading, but you'll see that like the readings are short and there's like a there's like a long note that I wrote before each one that's supposed to help you somehow understand it. There's also footnotes. The footnotes are all by me, obviously, right? Footnotes weren't invented. That's probably not obvious. Footnotes, I don't know when footnotes were invented in the 18th century. Um, all right. So anyway, I will see you on uh, Wednesday.